Hello everyone, this is Samsung. I am an associate professor at the School of Intellectual Property in East China University of Political Science and Law. I completed my PhD degree in law at Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, Australia. From the year of 2010, I've been teaching intellectual property law for both local Chinese students and international students. This course is about intellectual property law in China from a comparative perspective. It means we will not just look at the law in China, but also those in other countries. It's composed of three major units, which are patents, trademark, and copyright. However, before we move on to the three specific topics, we are going to have some background knowledge starting from an introduction to the entire legal system, including the RP system in mainland China. This unit for today is composed of four sessions. Session 1 is an overview of both the entire legal system and the political system in China. It is important for you to understand China's under IP system against this background. To contextualize the IP system in the entire legal and political system will enable you to have a bigger picture of the issues you are studying. Session 2 gives you, gives you a short history of the books and the developments of RP law in China. The key features of modern RP law is that it is a private property system and it enables the operation and the functioning of the so called market economy. Since the open the door policy was proposed and implemented in the beginning of the 1980s in China, the idea of a market economy replaced the philosophy of a central planned economy in China. By then, China has her own modern legal system, including the IP system. Session 3 provides you with an overview on the current legislative landscape of intellectual property in today's China. It covers both the national legislations and the international treaties to which China is a member country. Session 4 tells you how to protect the IP rights of your own or, or, or your clients. The legal rights confirmed on you on the paper are of course important, but it's even more important to understand how these rights are enforced in practice. China is well known by legal specialists for her dual protection system for intellectual property rights. As it could help you to suit the one infringing upon your intellectual property rights, and meanwhile, it could be even more efficient for you to ask help from IP administrative departments in China. Section 1 Legal System in today's China. From the perspectives of some scholars and practitioners in West countries, a number of problems and weaknesses remain in the current Chinese legal system. For example, law is not above the politics. Local protectionism as the system is still in a development, developmental stage and the efficiencies are obvious in both the legal system itself and the enforcement of RP rights. However, after taking the session for today and even the entire course, you may have your own understandings and views acquired.
take a look at the slides here, you will see the government structure in Western countries is a well known for the so called check and ballot structure. The Congress exercises the legislative power, the one to make legislations to create a legal system. And the Supreme Court is confirmed with the power of judiciary. And the government, the White House in the US, is the executive branch which is confront the power to exercise the administrative power. However, in China, we don't have that concept of for check the balance, at least not the version you can see from the United States. We have another version of check and balance. From this very brief introduction, it is arguable that you may not understand completely why it's checked and balanced. But it gives you a good starting point for you to consider the issue. The state power confirmed on any political or government organs cannot be without restrictions. The Constitution of China says that the power of the state should be put in the hand of the people. So from these slides you will see National People's Congress is on the top and the state council, the central government, the Supreme People's Court, Supreme People's Procurate, they're all affiliated to the National People's Congress. And the head of each department, each organs, are required to give reports to the National People's Congress. The National People's Congress under the Constitution, Constitution of China is the highest organ of state power. It is the organ or the authority to pass laws and it is the only authority to make law in China or put another way. Only the legal documents or rules passed by the National People's Congress and its standing committee can be called law. Any rules or regulations passed by the government's departments or ministries or local governments can only be called regulations, measures, or rules. It cannot be called laws. The National People's Congress can amend the Constitution and enact and amend basic fundamental laws governing state depart departments, public, civil and criminal matters. The Standing Committee of the National People's Congress has a power to interpret it and enact and amend laws other than those which must be enacted by the National People's Congress. The State Council is the central government of China. The State Council is composed of many ministries or departments. Each department, including the State Council itself, has the power to make regulations, rules, orders, which are nationally binding. 
this is a hierarchy of the governments in China. The state council is at a is at the national level. Only one government, one central government, is in mainland China. And the provinces, autonomous regions, and Hong Kong SAR, Macau SAR, the all local governments. The judiciary power, the Supreme People's Court and the local court are the one exercising the judiciary power to hear cases. This is the hierarchy of the courts in China. There is only one Supreme Court in China, one high court in each province, and a few intermediate people's court in each city, and on the bottom is the basic or district courts. So we have four levels of courts. Now in the case of intellectual property, you will see from the following slides. In recent years, China has undertaken a significant reform to establish a separate line of courts or specialist courts, which is called intellectual property court at the level of intermediate people's court. For instance, the Shanghai Intellectual Property Court, Beijing Intellectual Property Court. These courts located in those major cities is the most recent development of the courts structure in China. Keep in mind, Hong Kong SAR and Macau SAR and Taiwan are not in this system. Section 2 China's RP system from a historical perspective. Although ancient Chinese made a lot of famous inventions, such as paper making, gunpowder, and compass. But arguably, arguably, someone may have different views. But to a major scholars, or to the major strips of arguments, it is believed that there was no intellectual property system in ancient China. For instance, one of the research, one of the research by a Harvard professor, William Alford, was well known internationally in the recent 20 years. William Alford, in his book titled To Steal a Book is an Elegant Offense, published in 1995, examined the history of cultural and legal developments of RP. The title itself says, if someone stole a book to read, it's not a steal. So it is just a metaphor. To steal a book is an elegant offense. 
It's not a steal. It's not. It's not an offense. Why? Because at that time in ancient China, there is not such an idea that some rice may subsist in a book that can be preserved to the author instead of for the owner of the physical copy. So here, why we say it's a metaphor to steal the book is not an offense. It's not a steal. But actually, it is a steal, right? In a sense, you steal a book from your neighbor. That book is a physical property. It's owned by your neighbor. So you are stealing a physical property from your neighbor. But if you make additional copies of the book and sell it on the market, it would be for sure that's not your stealing. Why? It's quite simple. The exclusive rights conferred on the book, the writings created by the author, is the most recent invention of law. Without legislative outcomes which confirm clearly the legal rights in the intangible copies, those papers, it is unbelievable for those people to see any restrictions on the use of that book. So here, the key point is, keep it in mind, to steal the book is not stealing, it's merely a metaphor referring to the fact that the people don't have the basic concept of protecting the rights of the author. Again, I have to emphasize this or highlight that we are not talking about the physical property rights or the property rights in the physical copies of the book. We are talking about the copyrights from the perspective of today's IP system. So this is also a very good example for you to understand. In today's system, the legal rights conferred or subsist in the book itself could be divided into two groups. Group 1, the property rights in the physical copy. Group 2, the intangible rights, the copyrights, which confirmed on the author of the book. Copyrights as intangible rights is separate from the physical embodiment of the book, that's a physical copy of the book. Put simply, you spent $10 buying a book from the bookshop. You now own the property rights in that physical book, but you didn't buy any rights from the author. 
you don't have any rights to make additional copies of the book to sell those copies on the market or to write a new book based on this book or to make adaptations of this book because uh, these rights are comprised in the so-called copyrights. It's merely confirmed and can only be exercised by the author without permission from the author. You take a book and make additional copies. The making of those copies is illegal. Another example to understand a word without an intellectual system, for instance, a patent system is that. Imagine a family in ancient China with some secret to make some specific kind of wine. The secret to produce the beautiful wine is of course important to that family. And it definitely protected by that family. Any disclosure of that trade secret could endanger the business of that family or that factory if that family is operating a factory. In a case where that family didn't have a son, that could be a problem for the secret of producing that product being handed down to next generation. Why? Of course, the family would not disclose that trade secrets or the skills of producing the wine to anyone else. So in the case where the son of the family who died, the family would rather disclose the secret to his or her daughter-in-law instead of her own daughter, right? Why? Because if you disclose the trade secret to your daughter, and then your daughter married another man from another family, the trade secret will be passed on to another fam family. But your daughter-in-law married your son is still a member of your family. This could be a very interesting point to understand a word without patent system and how patent system may help the inventors to protect the inventors, enabling them to disclose their inventions to the public. Meanwhile, that disclosure will not lead to the loss of that control of that information. So to protect some know-how or specific knowledge or an invention, we have the legal system such as patent law and trade secret law. But in ancient China, there was no such a system to protect the inventor's rights after the invention is disclosed to the public. Once the information, the trade, the trade secrets or the know-how is made available to the public, the inventor would lose everything completely. 
in that case, those inventors would have no choice but to keep their inventions. Those inventions could be very critical knowledge to mankind, new knowledge to mankind, to the inventors themselves or their families. In that case, the entire society would not be allowed to benefit from the growth of new knowledge. The birth of a modern patent system solved this issue. So we will be back to this topic in the following weeks when we are studying patent law. It is important for you to understand how patent law is functioning against a private remedies available to the inventors, for instance, keeping these inventions a secret to themselves. The concept of intellectual property actually was accepted into China at the end of Qing Dynasty easily. For instance, the Qing Dynasty enacted some regulations and laws concerning the protection of intellectual property rights. For instance, the, the regulations on the reward of technical inventions, copyright law, and the provisional regulations on the regu registration of trademark. Why the modern IP system was so easily accepted into China, even in Qing Dynasty? So giving you this very interesting debate in the history of China around the, the, around the end of Qing Dynasty, you may have a very good understanding of the point. If you were a student from mainland China, you would have very good understanding of this argument. In the end of the Qing Dynasty, the entire nation was highly jeopardized by many Western powers for instance, the British Empire and the Japanese Empire. So those people at that time were desperate to looking for someone or some system to save China. And then in the end, some Chinese visited and studied in Western countries, in Europe, in the US, Japan. They came up with this conclusion. There could only be two gentlemen who may save China. The two gentlemen were called Mr. Democracy and Mr. Science. Democracy, of course, is the right solution to the political system at this time. And science, you see, is the right solution to the very fact that why China was so weak at that time, the military power, the economic power, those people realized the importance of industrialization, of new technologies. Why the warships from the British Empire, they're so powerful. They saw the power of science and technologies. And then those people dig deeper to see how can those two gentlemen 
survive in a country like China. In the case of science, they realize that a legal system to encourage inventions is the critical factors which contributes to the survival and functioning of the industrialization. So without any debates or significant debates or controversies, patent system were introduced and accepted into China, along with copyright law and trademark system. Those regulations and laws made by the Qing dynasty and the Kuomintang governments were enacted against the background that China, as you see, were trying to establish a modern legal system. So most laws in that time were imported or transplanted from Japan because of the quick collapse of the Qing dynasty and the social and economic situations in that time, those regulations and laws were never implemented. Now we move down to the history of New China. From 1949, when Communist Party took over China, mainland China. The dominant idea of a centrally planned economy or command economy economy was a key political philosophy following the experience of Soviet Union and that it turned out to be a failure. At that time, during, for instance, during the Cultural Revolution, it was said, well, to a factory worker, they don't have any rights to put his name on the product produced by the worker in the course of their duty. Why should an author be given the rights to put his name on the writings produced by him or her. Those people did not see the differences between the producers of tangible products and the authors of writings. Of course, there would be no space for the making of a legal system to protect the rights of those authors. This all came to the end of at the end of 1970s when Deng Xiaoping implemented the concept of market economy. The market economy is understood as an economy to enabling or to enable the market to play as the distributor of resources. There are a few fundamental rules required for a free market economy. For instance, in order to enable the market to be functioning, there must be pleasures on the market, right? The pleasures could be individual natural person and individual companies, legal persons. 
no matter you are an individual nature person, you are a student from a university, or you are a governor, or you are an official from the government, or even the queen or the king from the empire on the market, you are treated as a buyer or seller. The legal system shall not differentiate the individual sellers and buyers based on who they are. So put simply, individuals shall be protected and treated equally under the law. Otherwise, how can they play on the market? Number two, private properties must be equally protected and the transfer of ownership must be encouraged. Why? Because if there were no protection for ownership, and then there were no freedom to transfer an ownership of those private properties, what can be traded on the market? How can the market be functioning? So those are the key requirements to enable the functioning, the survival of a market economy. Anyone should be treated equally under the law. And ownership of private properties should be respected. Free transfer of private property shall be encouraged. Against this background, China started to establish her own legal system, including intellectual property system, which recognized and accept the concept that anyone should be treated equally. Private properties should be protected. Those modern legal system are mostly to protect all those the private properties or to accomplish those rules or the goals or the preconditions, preconditional requirements of a market economy. So if you understand this, you may understand. In any country with a market economy, the legal system shall have extensive similarities. You are doing a course on intellectual property in China. The knowledge you learn here is no different from the one you learn in the US, in Europe. That's why the recent or contemporary intellectual property law are basically similar in different countries. So, China's modern intellectual property laws were made between 1985 to 1992, the patent law, trademark law, and copyright law. In 2000, when China in two, in 1990s, China was imposed imposed a significant pressure by the United States. 
after the open the door policy was implemented. So that's why from 1990s to the middle of 1990s, China established the modern legal system. And then in 2010, when China was about to exit the WTO, it was a requirement of the WTO that China must amend her legal system significantly in order to satisfy the requirements of the WTO. So against this background, those legislations made in 1980s and the beginning of 1990s were amended for the first time. And from 2010 to now, China is working on the third amendments and the fourth amendments of our modern IP legislations, including the patent law, trademark law, and copyright law. You see, the first round of legislatures and the second round of legislatures took place against the background that China will impose significant pressure from the outsiders or foreign countries. However, the most recent legislative reforms do not take place against any foreign pressure. It's against the internal needs to upgrade our economy from a manufacturing economy or agricultural economy to an economy based on creativity and innovation. But what is intellectual property? Or can you give a definition of intellectual property? The answer is no. There is a no generally accepted concept of or definition of intellectual property. But when we say intellectual property in today's legal system, we are talking about a legal system to protect some rights generated from the invention of and the use of knowledge. So today, when we are talking about intellectual property, we refer to a few things. For instance, copyrights, trademark, patents. Generally speaking, those rights can be divided into two groups. Group one is called industrial property, which includes patents and trademark. Group two is called copyrights and related rights. It is important to keep this in mind because internationally, international conventions or established following the two lines. And in many countries, there are national departments or national judicial, sorry, national administrative authorities now also established following the two lines. For instance, in the United States, the government agency governing the protection or administration of patents and trademark is called U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, USPTO. 
However, the government agency concerning copyrights is called U.S. Copyright Office, which is affiliated to the Congress Library. So in, so in many different countries, there are administrative departments handling IP issues are generally divided into two divisions. Number one, the Patent and Trauma Office handling patent and trauma issues because patent and trauma and together with a few other new forms of industrial property, for instance, geographical indications and some legal rights on and plant varieties, they're all being confirmed, or those rights or the power all confirmed on the department's or office of industrial property. However, copyright office is a separate agency. That's also the same in China today. We had a very recent reform concerning the administrative branches governing intellectual property issues. Now we have a new national administration of intellectual property, which is handling patents and trademark issues and another department is called National Copyright Administration. So when you take a look at the three traditional concepts of intellectual property or traditional groups of intellectual property, patent, trademark, copyrights. While we have the different things under the same headings, intellectual property, because those, those things or the legal system governing those things shares extensive similarities. They all about the use of knowledge in different scenarios for useful idea, new knowledge inventions. The patent system grants an ex exclusive rights to inventors, enabling them to disclose their invention without worries of losing control over commercial benefits generated from their invention. Those ideas would be disclosed to the public for free, but to the public without permission from the patent owner, and not allowed to apply it to use it for manufacturing. Whereas copyrights protects different things. Copyrights protects so-called original expression of ideas. Copyrights does not protect the knowledge, the idea itself. It's merely protecting the expression of ideas. For instance, books, film, videos, and trademark protects the distinctive identities of the service or product suppliers. We will be back to the details of each area later in the following weeks. As we mentioned earlier, until now, there's, until now, there's a no 
simple definition on what is intellectual property. But when we are talking about intellectual property, for instance, the word intellectual property organization is a major international organization in charge of international intellectual property issues or is the only organization to administrate international treaties, major international treaties concerning intellectual property. In the convention establishing WRPO, a few things are enumerated as the topic of intellectual property. For instance, copyrights, inventions, trademarks, designs, and unfair competition, and all other rights resulting from intellectual activity in the industrial, scientific, literary, or artistic fields. You see, it's a very broad definition, or it's a very broad articulation or proposition concerning the scope of intellectual property. And the TRIPS agreement, administrated by World Trade Organization, WTO, enumerated intellectual property as copyrights and related rights, trademarks, are rights in geographical indication, industrial designs, inventions, patents or invention patents, rights in layout designs or topographies of integrated circuits, rights in trade secrets or copyrights. TRIPS is one of the most important international conventions in the field of intellectual property. It might be one of the most important one actually. You see, well, as we already have WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, to handle international conventions in the area of intellectual property, why we would have the World Trade Organization to be in charge of IP issues as well. As you, you may have a few basic knowledge of WTO. WTO is handling trade from three areas, the trade of goods, the trade of service, and the trade of intellectual property. So the trade of intellectual property is one of the key areas of WTO. The major international instruments is called TRIPS agreement or the trade related or the trade related aspects of intellectual property rights agreements in short TRIPS. The modern intellectual property system as we see is was born in many Western countries. We will be back to the short history of patent system, trademark system, or copyright system later in the following weeks. But here, we may take a look at the U.S. Constitution. The Article One, Section Eight grants powers to the Congress of the United States. The Congress 
is only allowed to exercise powers enumerated in this section. Without clear clause or provisions under the Constitution, the Federal Congress shall not have powers. So here, in the case of intellectual property, you see section 8. This is only one of the clause or one of the power enumerated here. It's a long list. To promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive rights to their respective writings and, and discoveries. Well, my question here for you is that please take a closer look at this paragraph. You see, to promote the progress of what? Of science and what? Useful arts. By securing for limited times to authors and inventors the rise to their writings and discoveries. So my question is, please find the right translation of this sentence and tell me what does it mean when the lawmaker the framer of the U.S. Constitution put here by using the term science and useful arts. Whose science or whose rights to be protected concerning the progress of science? Authors or inventors? You say the progress of science and useful arts to authors and inventors. So whose science, whose useful arts? And here, to their respective writings and discoveries. So whose writings, whose discoveries? So there cannot be a grammar mistake, right? The science. The author science, why they use author here following science? And the useful arts following inventors. And then writings to authors, discoveries to inventors. So let me be clear. Please go deeper. Do some research and find out some key information or give me your own answer. So this is one of the assignments for the le for this lecture. Apart from the three fields of traditional intellectual property, patent, trademark, and copyrights. With the advance of new technologies, new inventions, or new forms of creations, inventor, inventions are created or invented by mankind. For instance, plant varieties, and semi semiconductor topographies and database and new forms of industrial properties are not covered by the three major or three traditional field of patent, trademark, and copyrights. It means in many countries, usually, there will be separate legislations to protect the rights 
concerning plant varieties, topographics, and database, and a few other new forms of industrial properties. Here, let's have uh, an example or a good story for you to understand how the modern IP system was invented and what it's about. What's the core features of the modern IP system? In the year of 1594, Galileo received a patent on a device for raising water by means of a house. You see, this is a big deal at that time. Why? Because that was an agricultural economy, and the productivity of the society hardly dep depends on the productivity of farmers. And sometimes it's not merely depends on the farmers, right? It also depends on on the gold or on the weather. Whether whether the gold will give you sufficient water for your farm. Galileo's invention was of course cool significant. Significant in the sense of um, facilitating economic growth to generate more goods and more food. So the local government received a request from Galileo. Galileo claimed that, well, I invented something which you see of course, very important and very useful to each farmers and to the country. But I'm not going to give it to anyone for free. I'm not going to charge individual farmers, but I'm going to, or well, I'm looking for some rewards or economic rewards from the government. In exchange, I will give you my invention. So the solution offered by the local governments can be considered as another invention. That's a invention of legal system. Today, Galileo's invention have long been gone because it's not useful anymore. But the local councils of that city, that invention by the local council is still in place today. Why? If you take a look at what we have here on the slides, you will see. It says that's by the authority of this council is granted to Mr. Galileo that for the space of the next 20 years, other than him or his agents, are not allowed in the city or any place in our state to make, have made, or if made elsewhere, to use a device invented by him for raising waters and irrigating fields by which, so the following paragraphs, the following paragraph were detailed descri uh, descriptions of um, the technical details of his invention. Basically, there's a dis complete disclosure of Galileo's invention with this piece of paper. Any individual farmer would know how to make this device. 
So that's kind that they this is a an agreement reached by Galileo and the state, the government, and actually individuals who was going to use this device or this invention. Galileo fully disclosed his invention, the new knowledge to the public. In return, the state will protect him for 20 years. The entire society would know the details of his invention. So the knowledge of mankind can grow and then develop. At the same time, Galileo still may maintain some control over the use of his invention, his great idea. And this paragraph here is a code structure of a modern patent system. The modern patent system still basically state without any change or any significant change. A few key points here. Number one, the patent rights is granted to the individual inventors, in this case Galileo, by the state power and is only effective in that country, within that territory. Number two, that rise lasts for only 20 years. So there is a specific clear limit on the length of rise. Number three, the rights granted to Galileo, the inventor, were only limited to the rights of making the device. or if made elsewhere, to use the device or to import the device, the invention, from a foreign country and sell it on the market. So those are the exclusive rights conferred on the patent owner. They basically stay, still stay the same today. You still can find these rights in the patent law in China, in the US. In Australia. So this invention of a delicate legal system is a win 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 solution. Anyone needs a winner. Galileo now can have some economic benefits charged for the use of his invention. The state, the country, now can benefit from his invention as well because the use of his invention will significantly facilitate the growth of productivity and the growth of the economy. And the individual users, the farmers here, they would only need to pay a few, a very small, tiny amount of money or anything equivalent to economic benefits, or could be cash, could be uh, something else. To use his Galileo's invention. So basically, the three parties here, 
right, as we have today. The patent owner, the inventor, the use the consumers of those new technologies, and the country, the state, and the entire society. So in this case, Galileo was looking for some economic benefits generated from the use of his invention. However, in another case, Madame Curie, she just decided not to patent her invention, giving it for free to anyone. Well, to Madame Curie, she may give up the legal rights conferred on her. That's no problem. But to inventors like Galileo, the patent system could be a very reliable approach to monetize his or her invention. So Dr. M Madame Curie discovered radioactive, radioactive metals, radium or polonium, and she also invented a method of processing radium or its medical applications. So here, we have a few, we have two points here, right? Number all, at least here, Medicuri's contribution. Number one, she discovered this metals which is radioactive Can this very facts be discovered? Oh, sorry, be patented? Of course, no. Discoveries cannot be patented because that's a mere fact which already exists in the world. It's not an invention and creation of any mankind. But she invented the methods of processing these mental elements and its medical applications. Those methods, of course, are patentable. So what was given up by Madame Curie was not the rise in discoveries but potential patent rise in the methods of processing radium or its medical applications, those method inventions. Those methods are inventions. So when we're talking about invention, it could be a product invention related to the producing of or to the physical thing produced using that technology or that invention or a method, a process to do certain things, to produce things. The invention could be a product itself, product invention, could be the method to make the products, the method product invention. Now you may have a big picture of what intellectual property is. Generally speaking, intellectual property regime conferred on the inventors, the authors, a set of exclusive rights or legal rights. And also, as you can see, those rights confront on inventors and authors are very different from those rights confront on the owners of a piece of land. 
physical properties, a house, or your mobile phone, your car. The rights confront on those in the intangible objects, and the rights, the property rights, or the intellectual property rights, subsist in inventions, writings. And the property rights subsist in physical properties, for instance, land, real estate, or movable estate, car, your watch, your smartphones. What are the differences between them? Number one. The subject matter of intellectual properties do not have any material entity like classical traditional property laws. Intellectual property itself is conceptually distinct from the property in which it resides. Subjects of intellectual property are intangible. So we still remember. The case we mentioned earlier concerning stealing a book is an elegant offense. You steal a book. That's in that offense on the, of course, the property rights in the book itself. You're not infringing any rights. Owned by the author, but if you steal a book and then make pirate copies of those books and sell it on the market, well, that will be the breach of property law and intellectual property law, and of course, could be criminal law. So the point is, the rights in the intangible creations, inventions, and writings. And arise in the physical embodiment of those rights, they are separable. You pay ten dollars buying a book for the ownership, acquiring the ownership, and that book as a physical property, but not any rights in that writings, or any copyrights in that writings, or intellectual property rights in that writings. Owners of a property rights could be protected in China and in any other country. For instance, your ownership in your laptop is recognized and protected in China. No one can take it away from you without your promotion, your without your permission. And these rights, this ownership, of course, also acknowledged in the U.S. Your rights in your personal security, in your personality, in your arm, are all protected internationally, universally. But intellectual property rights are granted in that nation and only recognized and protected in that nation. It won't go beyond that territory. Of that country, where the rights granted. Number three, your property rights in a real property or real estate, a physical property, your apartment, your land, may exist forever as long as the good itself or the property itself. Exist. However, for intellectual property rights, there is always a limited period of protection. In the case of invention patents, twenty years. In the case of trademark, ten years, but renewable for another ten years. 
and unlimited times of renew, renewing. In the case of trademark, trademark. In the case of uh, copyrights, on the Chinese copyright law, the author's copyright is protected for the life of the author plus 50 years after the death of the author. So pretty much over 100 years. But no matter how long it is, there would always be a limited period of time. Intellectual property, intellectual property rights does not last forever. Number four, if you own an apple, right, an orange, which is a subject matter of a physical property rights, you eat it, uh, and then it will be gone. The apple won't exist, and then your rights, of course, in the property will be gone. So it could be consumed by using, but intellectual property rights are not consumed by using. You use a, you bought the book and you use the book, and you are not using any copyrights. Number five, intellectual property rights by nature is a, a set of monopolistic absolute rights. It can be transferred to anyone else by licensing it to the licensee or by transferring the ownership of the rights. Number four. For the purpose of some of the rights covered in the scope of intellectual property, registration is needed. For instance, patent, trademark. You have to do registration and being granted by the specific government departments, for instance, patent and trademark office, acknowledging your patents. Or your trademark. Now we are going through a very brief introduction to the IP legislations in China. The sources of uh, IP law in China include the laws, as we mentioned earlier, the laws made passed by the National People's Congress and its standing committee is called law include patent law of China made in 1984 amended in 2000 2008 and the fourth amendment is on the way and in the case of uh, Protection of new varieties, there's a separate regulation made by state council, but not by the National People's Congress. It's a regulation. A trademark law of China, made in 1982, amended in 2001 and 2013 and 2019. And increasingly, unfair competition law is becoming one of the major area of intellectual property because it protects some rights which could be similar to the protection or to the rights available to inventors or authors, particularly in the case of uh, protection for trade dress or using the term here in China, the decoration of a product, the package of the product. I will be back to this topic in the following weeks when we are studying trademark law. Copyright law of China passed in 1990 
amended in 2001 and 2010, and potentially this year, 2020. Of course, there are a lot of uh, regulations made by administrations, administrative powers. Copyrights Office of China, the National Ad Administration of Intellectual Property of China, those called um, by those government agencies, those called regulations. And the judicial interpretations made by the Supreme Courts of China. We have a large number of judicial interpretations in the case of intellectual property law and in the case of many, many other issues. The Supreme Courts keep issuing judicial interpretations, which are, of course, national, nationally binding in China. And the practice of issuing, making judicial interpretations by the Supreme Courts of China is quite distinct compared to the exercises, the practices in any other country. Most other countries, the Supreme Courts don't do this. And international conventions, um, please keep in mind those key international instruments. For instance, Paris Convention for the Protection of Industrial Property, which covers the protection of trademark and patents. And the Berne Convention for the Protection of Literary and Artistic for the protection of copyrights and trade related aspects of intellectual property rights, TRIPS agreement, which covers many issues, right? Copyrights, patent, trademark, and a few other new forms of uh, industrial property. And the WIPO copyright treaties, WIPO performances and the phonograph treaties will be back to those international conventions when we are talking about or studying copyright law. Number four, protecting your IPR in China. As we mentioned earlier in the beginning, China is famous for its uh, IP enforcement system. What does that mean? 